In this video, we'll continue our discussion of psychological disorders by talking about the etiology or causes of psychological disorders. Now I'll note that in future videos we'll talk about the causes or etiology of specific types of psychological disorders like anxiety disorders or mood disorders. In this video, however, we're really going to focus on general explanations that apply broadly to many types of psychological disorders. So let's start by discussing the biopsychosocial model of psychological disorders. So this is a big uh, word here, but I've kind of split it up into its three components, the bio, the psycho, and the social. And this model proposes that bio, psycho, and social types of factors contribute to the development and perpetuation of psychological disorders. So let me break that down. Bio, of course, refers to biological factors such as brain chemistry, having an imbalance of neurotransmitters like serotonin, things like that, and also genetics, genetic vulnerabilities. Psycho here refers to psychosocial factors such as uh, cognitive factors, maladaptive thought patterns. And finally, social refers to sociocultural factors such as interpersonal interactions, your lifestyle, the community to which you belong. How do all of those impact the development of psychological disorders? Now let's focus specifically on biological factors for just a moment. A large literature of research suggests that most psychological disorders have a genetic component and that some disorders are even primarily caused by genetics. Let's take a look at a graph of heritability estimates for schizophrenia to illustrate. And you can take a look at my video, Heritability and How Psychologists Assess Nature versus Nurture, to learn more about heritability, but I'll just keep things general for now. So let's break this down. On the x-axis here, you have the percent risk of developing schizophrenia, right over here. On the y-axis, you have the relationship to a person with schizophrenia. So the question is, as we get further and further down this y-axis, as you can see, we share more genetic material with identical twins, for example, than we do with the general population. So as we get further and further down the y-axis, does the percent risk of developing schizophrenia increase? Let's take it step by step. So the chance of you developing schizophrenia just based on the general population, there's not really a relationship there, right? Just because some random person in the general population has schizophrenia, that's not going to impact how uh, likely it is you'll develop it because you share no genetic information. You don't share anything with that person. But let's start moving on. So first cousins, for example, 12.5% of the genes shared. You'll notice this bar is a little bit bigger your percentage risk of developing schizophrenia, if your first cousin has it, is a little bit greater than just if some guy in the general population has it. Moving along, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, grandchildren and half-siblings, you share 25% of your genes with these people, and if one of them has schizophrenia, you have a greater chance of developing it as well. Moving further, parents, siblings, children, and fraternal twins, you share 50% of your genetic information with these, uh, these people, these family members, and so your risk of developing schizophrenia increases even more if one of them has it. And finally, identical twins. As we've learned from previous videos, you share 100% of your genetic material with identical twins, and so look at the risk of developing schizophrenia, something like 48%. If your identical twin has it, it's a coin flip of whether you have it as well or will develop it at least. So the punchline here is that the more genes, the more genetic information you share with a person who has schizophrenia, the more likely it is that you'll develop it yourself. And this suggests a significant genetic or biological component to the development of schizophrenia. So biology is clearly important to the development of psychological disorders, but the biopsychosocial model of psychological disorders suggests that other sorts of factors are important too. And this diathesis stress model that you're seeing here integrates these perspectives nicely by proposing that psychological disorders are the joint product of an underlying predisposition for a disorder and adverse environmental or psychological events that trigger that vulnerability. So here, predisposition is what we call the diathesis, which is typically the biological component of the model, like a genetic vulnerability as we've discussed already. I will note that it doesn't have to be biological, however. 
For example, having a pessimistic outlook on life could be a vulnerability that's considered a psychological diathesis, and there's not really anything biological about that. The adverse environmental or psychological events, which can include anything from childhood maltreatment to trauma or whatever you can imagine, we call this the stress, the psychological and sociocultural components of the model. The key idea behind this model is that both diathesis and stress are required to develop a psychological disorder.